Never spoken on a lavalier before, so that's going to be interesting, this thing hanging on my head. Um, the, um, some ground rules. Number one, PowerPoint is harder than I thought. Uh, <laughs> so if you don't see fancy circles and stuff, just trust the spirit. Um, Serm- circles, right? Sermon prep is harder than I thought because you know, the Lord does take you to the woodshed when you, so you don't be a big old hypocrite when you speak. And um, the, the other thing is just I wanted to share my heart that just um, in what I'm going to teach is most of this is what I'm living. I am, a, I am a glorious mess like anybody else. I am got days when, man, me and Jesus are like this, and I've got days when I'm wondering if my salvation really stuck, Uh, and I'm somewhere in the middle some days, and so I'm working out my faith, fear and trembling just like you are, so just hear my heart that that's where I'm coming from. Um, Now I see, there's a, I know I see him do a button on this thing, so, okay. Jesus and, so this kind of came out of a, uh, intercessory prayer time. Steve asked me to share on it. Um, And so I'm going to take a page from Alan, and we're going to start with a couple quotes, uh, just to loosen me up a little bit. And uh, just like with Alan's message, if you hear something that's not of the Lord or you disagree with, email Alan. (laughs) (laughs) Not me. (laughs) I just thought I'd throw that out. I have to laugh. It helps me. Oh. All right, Jesus and, quote one, if Christ is risen, nothing else matters, and if Christ is not risen, nothing else matters. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Now, I like this one because God doesn't let me apply many equations to his kingdom, but here's one he actually allows me to apply. I like equations, I like things to be balanced, and... This one, I was like, okay, Lord, finally, you let me pin you in a corner. Jesus plus nothing is everything. So now, the Lord speaks to all of us in different ways. And one of the ways he likes to speak to me is, I like science. I like especially physics and different things like that. So that's the way I see. I mean, to me, in studying physics and chemistry and other things, it screams creator to me. It screams the genius of our creator and how awesome he is both in the infinitely big and the infinitely small. And so here, when I knew I was going to be speaking on the sermon title, by the way, is Jesus and dot, dot, dot. When I knew I was going to be speaking on this, the picture I kept getting in my head was a spinning top, like a child's toy. So thanks to Amazon.com, I now own a spinning top, <laughs> a high dollar one at that. Uh, that's a picture of it. Yep, nothing but the best for sermons, right? Uh, Not even Shutterstock. I I took that myself. All right. So the metal top is designed for one purpose, to spin. Okay? We all agree with that. A designer created it for this reason. It was thawed out. It was engineered. It was milled. It was cut on the CNC, whatever. It was designed for one purpose, to spin. So now I'm going to take you just for, I'm going to nerd out just for one or two slides and we'll go into more scriptures. Okay, so I did some experiments with this top because that's the way I think. This top, as designed, will spin for about 85 seconds on average with one spin. I did that over, you know, checked it, timed it. It'll spin, all right? It's a metric. I told you I like equations. So what I did then I took a metal BB, like your kids' BB guns, and I stuck it, literally, to the side of the top. Just one BB. How did you get this? Tape. (laughs) Tape and a little bit of frustration, because it took me several tries to get it to not sling off, and I was going to glue it. That didn't work. But anyway, (laughs) trial and error. But I taped it to the side, and just in case for you nerds that want to know, that added about 4% to the total weight. So the weight of the top, I added only about 4%. We're going somewhere, so bear with me. With the BB now attached, the top will spin for about 43 seconds. So with a 4% increase, it cut it in half of what it was designed to do. 
And eccentricity, fancy word that just means uh, the measure of off-centeredness, out of bounds, right, was introduced to the system which hampered its design. Okay? Physics. So my experimental conclusion, my hypothesis, the greater the mass added to the top's edge, the more wobble that occurs in the less time the top spins, the eccentric load impedes its design. All right, that's the picture I want us to have. So when you, I use the word later in the message about the wobble, the introduced wobble, we understand that's our picture. All right. Now, Paul, in a lot of his letters, and I can't even fathom it, to be truthful, I take for granted our scriptures. I can't fathom that, you know, what the King James, I think, was 1611, I think was the first. I realize the letters were all floating around, and I understand how the Bible came to be, but... I mean, here's Paul showing up in these towns, establishing churches, and like, see you, no fax machine, no nothing. I mean, he's sending back letters, but just, they couldn't go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 20, you know, whatever. They were working it out with the Holy Spirit. So it seems like in Paul's letters, a lot of times he's dealing with this competition for the gospel. Things rubbing up against the gospel, things coming and trying to be added unto the gospel. So, a couple of scriptures, and I just did this, I could have picked, I culled a bunch of scriptures just trying to, to go through this. And I only have 15 slides, so I figured if I'm going to speak, might as well be short, then you really would like me get out earlier. But anyway, I'm afraid that in the same way that the serpent in the garden deceived Eve by his cleverness, so it was, this, it was the enemy's cleverness, your mind should be led astray from the simplicity and purity that belongs to Christ. That's, that little phrase, simplicity and purity, kind of gigged me a little bit because if I make Christ more complicated than he is, then I'm more accountable to it. If, he, if, he's more, if it's more complex, then it, it, it takes a more clever person than me or it takes a more diligent person than me. But if I keep Christ, the simplicity and the purity of the gospel, I'm a little more accountable to being an instrument of it. Just a thought. See to it that no one takes you captive, literally captive as you think it would be, through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Now, we can understand philosophy, a way of thinking, a, a view, a worldview. We can understand deception. Deception is just flat out being tricked, right? Thought you were buying this, you got this. You've been deceived. We can understand the tradition of men. We've all probably, especially those that have come up through churches, have seen traditions try to get laid on people, what you should do, how you should act. I remember when I got saved, I was like, okay, I can't drink, can't smoke, can't cuss, can't, you know, I was like, I was stuck. I didn't even know what Brian looked like anymore because he just told me all the stuff I couldn't do, but nobody bothered to tell me what I could do. But the one that's interesting to me is the elementary principles of the world. I went down a uh, rabbit trail. I Googled, I YouTubed on how to put that line under there. But anyway, <laughs> the elementary principles of the world was a cool thing. I went down a rabbit trail on that scripture and elementary spirits of the world, rudimentary spirits of the world. It's kind of a cool phrase. I won't bore you with all the details, but I thought this was an important one because this is what I see a lot in my own life, the risk, the BBs trying to be tacked on to my top, so to speak. And here's the Brian definition. You can write your own. My definition of that thing is any worldly sourced idea that tries to replace, amend, or modify a truth of our faith. So that's kind of like, like I try to sprinkle in a little bit of this logic and a little bit of this reason, and I try to kind of bake a cake of a little bit of Jesus, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and have my own form of faith. That's, I'm, I'm sitting there trying to meticulously glue BBs to this dinky little top, but that's what's happening in my heart. I'm trying to add to it, and it's starting to make me wobble. All right. I have no idea what's next. Oh, this one. If you indeed remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard. I like that version. I'm reading through the, I did all the Greek and Hebrew that 
that Strong's Concordance and all that good stuff. Um, I like that term shifted away. That literally what drawn away from, pulled into. That's literally what that means. And so I just was trying to wrestle with that. We see that to remain grounded and steadfast in the faith as opposed to being shifted or drawn away. Again, we see all the way really from Genesis all the way through today, people are always wrestling with being drawn away from the Lord, being pulled to and fro by things, having things added unto the gospel or to themselves or to their own lives, Jesus and this. Now, remember, you probably, maybe you do, maybe you don't, your Bible scholars, Demos. Demos, Demos, I don't know. In Philemon, about 57 to 62, mentioned as a fellow worker. In Colossians, about 62, mentioned with a good list of good people working with Paul, Luke, and others. In 2 Timothy, Paul notes that Demos left for the love of the world. Big shift. His heart, somewhere in that time period. And I, now, I've been at New Life, and this is my only, I, I've, I've been here a long time. I've been here, I was thinking up here, I've been here 27 years at New Life. And I have seen so many people come and go. And that's okay. But what it really breaks my heart is when I see them shift. It's not that they suddenly just say, I don't believe in Jesus anymore. They kind of more drift into this own little apathy or form of godliness or or, or something that, or they got themselves offended, or what, and they just drift away, and, and it really makes me sad. So I wondered about Demos, what caused his wobble to start? Divided his heart, and eventually drew him away. There were things in his life that eventually were, that eventually gave place, and again, see the top? Something got added to him, and the wobble started. And the greater the mass, the greater the... I mean, you know, it makes sense in a way. If I'm fighting pornography, that's a huge issue. And I'm probably not even going to be able to spin the, spin the top. But there's also these little subtle things that get added unto us that can, that can introduce problems and introduce a way of thinking that can be troubling. I can do all things, we know these scriptures, through him who strengthens me. So we have this established principle that all things, all things can strengthen us, okay? He is before all things, and by him all things are held together. Now that's cool. I mean, that's like the eclipse is coming tomorrow, right? So that's like the, the planetary motion, all that gravity that's happening, all things he's holding together, uh, relationships you have, ways of thinking, everything is all under Jesus Christ. It's all being held together by him and his mercy. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. So we see there an element of faith applied, as Alan taught so well this morning. I love that teaching. So faith is the currency of the kingdom. Keep that in mind, right? You can't, I can't go to Mexico and hand them, you know, dollars. I have to convert my money, can't, I can, I have to convert my money to pesos, theoretically, or any other thing. I have to have the currency that, that works in that kingdom, that realm. Well, faith is our currency that we've been given a measure of. So here's my, for me, I'm a, I'm a very picture-oriented. So this, it took me probably, I won't tell you how long it took me to build this in PowerPoint. So we're going to try to... See how it looks up on the screen. So here's my, I have a measure of faith or trust. You know, I can, especially what I say, what I believe about Christ. And so I represented that in kind of this blue. This is the measure I have. So my measure of faith and trust is deposited in the cross in Christ. That's the, that's the flow. That's that top and perfect spinning symmetry. And then I used a hexagons because not circles <laughs> yeah yeah circle yeah I, I didn't get the copyright release on circle scripture so. so all those little green dots represent many things in our lives that, but it almost come under Christ Christ has given us so many cool things but it's still got to come under that it's got to be 
through the cross. So what happens, and this is, I'm going to give personal experience here because I am, this is a tough one for me. Again, I've been to the woodshed all week or so for this. So, I won't make you guess who this is. Maybe you know. So when I came to New Life all those years ago, I came out of a revival and got to see things that most people have never seen. It was really an incredible time in my life. Tanya and I were, we'd, we like the dog who caught the car. We didn't know what we were doing. And so when, we, when that kind of crashed and burned, we came out of that. And my heart still longed for that Holy Spirit stuff. And I did not even know, I was a Christian by that time. When I came here, I'd been a Christian about three, four years, something like that. And um, my heart hungered for that. And I, actually, and I remember Steve taught a sermon series on the disciplines of faith. Fasting, meditation, all those kind of things. Because before that, I had walked into a revival, so I just thought following God was easy. This is like a big party all the time. So I really, I had no good anchoring in the Word. So I was introduced to the Catholic mystics. Now, whatever you think of them or not, I'll leave that with you and the Holy Spirit. I really like this lady. Her name was St. Teresa of Avila. She's got some great quotes. Um, she seemed like a character, but this is uh, St. Teresa of Avila, born in the 1500s in Spain, uh, influenced St. John of the Cross, which I've read his stuff too. Best I can read it. It's really hard reading. <laughs> So's hers, because it's translated from medieval Spanish into English, so it gets kind of weird. Wrote the interior castle. So that interior castle stuff, and I'm not going to stay on this real long, is ways to meditate. And she was famous. I mean, she said things like, at a certain castle, she would see the Dalai Lama and all these other peoples, and she almost had to put her fingers in her ears till she crossed over to get to God. I mean, it was like, but I wanted to be a mystic, is what I wanted. I wanted that connection with the Holy Spirit. So I got pretty darn into meditation. Now, there's a healthy meditation. It's scriptural, right? New Age has copied it, abused it, and corrupted it. But there is a meditation aspect to scripture. That word meditation from the Hebrew is to chew on, to consider, to grind through. So there's nothing wrong with meditation. Don't let the word scare us. But I really went deep, and it was hard, you know, sitting down for more than 15 seconds, and I'm thinking about the oil change I got to do, and the fact that I forgot to pick up my clothes again. I mean, all that stuff. It took a long time to get my mind to and hear the Lord. It was a pretty cool season. But what happened is, it went from being that green dot under Christ to being attached to the side of my top. Because I gave it an importance or a measure of faith outside of Christ. Now I needed to be Jesus and a good meditator if I really wanted the secret trick to being in the presence of God. Does that make sense? My heart started being drifted away, and I started giving an unusual amount of importance to this. And so that's, I just wanted to give you a type or a picture of what a BB being glued to the top looks like to me. Nothing wrong. I mean, again, however you want to, Measure out the Catholic mystics, that's fine. I think there's value in what they do, but you have to just take it to the cross. But for me, it got out of balance. It suddenly was, well, Alan, if you really want to know God, you need to know Jesus and how to meditate. That's the real thing. And so it got kind of weird there for me. It started getting a weight of its own outside of the cross. Does that make any sense? So that's a personal thing for me. Now, I've had many of these, unfortunately. I've got a lot of glue remover, maybe, from the BBs trying to... <laughs> that's called repentance. But anyway, the, so this is just an example of a heart that was hungry for the Holy Spirit trying to kind of get on God's good side. How can, I, how can I get a little... I just want to be more cool. I want it to be in more. I wanted to find my own gate into... The presence of God. It's, it, that's where my heart ended up. It didn't start there, but that's where it drifted. And so this is, this is probably the crux of my message is the subtleties at which we can drift and add to the gospel, add to cross, even good things. They can suddenly take on a weight that's not appropriate. So what happened is with the St. Teresa thing and other things is this is what it looks like. Again, PowerPoint magic here. 
But, oh yeah, first this. This is a principle that I use a lot. And I don't use it well a lot, but I use it a lot. <laughs> Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. Now that's a strong, there's no ambiguity about that scripture. <laughs> it's either unity or it's divided. Is laid waste. No city or house divided against itself will stand. It's almost like a promise, like the kind of promise you don't want. <laughs> a household or a marriage or relationships or whatever won't stand if there's division. It's, it's a principle. And so we begin to understand then, if that green dot went away on the bottom, that was my, that again took quite a while. So the green dot went away, and now it appears up here. It now has almost the same weight as the cross. Whether I say it out loud or not, my actions give me away. And suddenly my faith looks like this. My faith is now divided. Now I'm like 80% Christ and 20% meditation. 80% Christ, 20% money or whatever. It gets kind of weird. In my, I end up with this kind of mixed bag of faith. And I'm asking for a big wobble. That's my heart. I'm, I'm, I'm moving, I'm shaking. I, I'm not being as I was designed to do. So, the wobble has been introduced. <laughs> so there's the top, there's the BB, there's the wobble. That little bit of mass on that top was enough to cause it to cut it completely in half of its efficiency. Makes me wonder, and see what's interesting to me is like even with the St. Teresa of Avila story I told you, it's not even, it's even that I put the wrong weight on it, but then it started influencing my conversation, the way I saw other people, the way I saw the Lord. It, it, started, it started flowing into different areas of my life subtly without me even realizing it until the Lord checked me hard one time, and then I said, I haven't meditated in a long time. <laughs> I had to cut it out and then try again. But anyway, that's just the way the Lord works with me. So... Again, we see this in Scripture. Pretty strong statement here. I mean, sir, Jesus says, don't call people foolish. It's a funny word that, that Paul, I mean, so in other words, Paul's, he's, he's frustrated with his church plant. You foolish Galatians, who has cast a spell on you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? I only want you to learn, I only want to learn this from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by believing in what you heard? Are you so foolish? And this last one's important to me. After beginning by the Spirit, you are now finishing by the flesh. Ouch. That one, I think any believer wrestles with that to some extent. So again, this is not a shame message or a, you've been caught with your hand in the cookie jar type message. This is a chance to get free of some of this. Get the BBs cut off. It's on, if honest, it can be difficult to not rest or rely on human-only efforts. Now, if I'm being real, it's like, Lord, you seem to be a little bit late on this situation. I think I will step in at this point. I got this one. And then my heart would say, thanks for the salvation, Lord, but I got this. I'll call you if I get in over my head. It's my actions will betray me way quicker than my words. I'm, I'm too religious to say that out loud most of the time. But my actions will certainly take me there. In case of crisis, break glass, pull alarm. That was my prayer life for a long time. <laughs> like the little red box over there. Oh, screwed up again, Lord. Help! <laughs> Got it. I'll call you again if I need you. Again, I would never say that to the Lord directly, but again, my actions would betray me that I'm trying my best to fix my life where I think the Lord's fallen short or he needs a little help. And that's a real danger because, again, it's going to cause you to wobble whether you realize it or not. I think for some areas of my life I've wobbled so long I'm assuming it's normal. Just a few BBs I've seen over the years. This is not accusational. A lot of this I've done myself. Again, so hear my heart in this and I just but I made a list or two this is not an exhaustive list there's some weird things out there that people get latched on to so 
So the faith-oriented ones, quest or revival, I've definitely had that one, where the weight of wanting revival was more important to me than Jesus Christ and salvation. I wanted the stuff. I wanted to see the signs and the wonders and the cool things that I read about to the point that I had that as equal weight with the cross. Does that make sense? Now, the Lord's heart's for revival. And a lot of, all these things are good, but they're good when they're under the cross, when they're in the alignment of faith. Baptism of the Spirit, man, that, that, Alan's had some good teaching on that, but you throw that in the room like a land hand grenade and on you know, people's opinions and theology. And again, that thing, I've seen that thing, but you're like, oh, you're born again, but are you baptized? Because that's really, that really makes you a real Christian, not a, a wannabe or, or the haves and the have nots. I, I don't understand that theology struggles. So I've, I've wrestled with that one. Holy Spirit signs, prophecy. I, I'm, I've known people that seem to, you know, prophecy through Christ, prophecy is of the Lord, prophecy is of Scripture, but this prophecy thing starts taking its own mystical weight. And so you have the cross of Christ and this weighty mystical prophet persona. I mean, I'm, there's even people I've met, I wonder if I've ever even really met them, because I always meet the prophet, the, the mystic. It's like, a, it's like a mask they're wearing to protect. I, I don't know, it gets weird. And so... Prayer methods, I mean, just there's all kinds of things that begin as the good, but suddenly have this weird, abnormal weight. Judaism, uh, again, like the, we have the chosen, the, the group, the Judaism group that studies our, is, the, is to learn about Passover, is to learn about all these Jewish, that is the inheritance, of, that's the roots of our faith. Is that encouraging? Is it powerful? Is it incredible? Yes, but I've seen people's lives where the Judaism gets put up here and it's just like back to Galatians. It's Jesus and this. Jesus and this. And it really sends a mixed signal to people. It's like, oh wait, now I have to trust in Christ alone. Oh, and bow my head when I pray. Okay, got it. No, no, no. Wear a suit. No, no, wait. Wait. It just gets weird when we start putting those things on people. Again, none of this is wrong. I have friends that are uh, really strong Calvinist, really strong, and they don't like me for a lot of for my thoughts. But anyway, but that thing is so important to them. That's the first conversation. That's the filter they run everything through, and it just seems to have an abnormal emphasis in their life outside of the cross. Does that make sense? I have no problem with really great theology, but I don't, my theology can't be so perfect that I put it up here with Jesus' cross. Because there's always a humility and a, humili and a humbleness that says, I don't know everything. God surprises me quite often. And if I were in charge, I, you know, I, I have all these same wrestlings you do. Types of music, I... <laughs> Tanya and I joke, we, we got saved. I got saved, I, I met Tanya shortly after, and she grew up with Southern gospel music, and I was thinking, dear Lord, if, there's, if this is the best you got, I can't follow you. <laughs> I can't hang, I cannot hang with this. But it, you, it, what is in my heart was a bias. And so, um, thanks to Spotify, that I've been delivered of all that, but the... Uh, Types of music had this weird weight to some people. Like, oh, you've got to have Bethel music to really hear the Spirit versus this hymn. And again, it's a heart issue. It's like, does it have some weird position in your, in your, in your mind? Or is it a filter now that you've built because you've given this more weight than the other? Tongues, I won't even go there. I'm not like Alan. I won't jump into these hard subjects. <laughs> but... Again, I've seen abnormal weight given to tongues, and we saw that in the entire book, in the book of Corinthians, right? That was the Corinthians gold star. I speak in tongues, therefore I'm super Christian. You know, it's just a weird thing that got out of control, and Paul had to call it down and put it in the right order. He didn't say it's not of God. He just said, you're, you're making a big deal out of this when it should be under the cross. It's all under the authority of Christ. Man-made rules. Plenty of those around. World-oriented. This one hurts. 
Money. Money is the one of the quickest ways the Lord can snatch my heart. I mean, the Lord can challenge me. I, I don't like it, but it, it has teeth. Um, Jesus point blank says we can't love both the world and money. So that scripture is very obvious. But we clearly see that people give this weight or importance to a bank account or to a job or to their resources that, again, can bring a wobble into it. I remember uh, the one guy I heard preach, he said, every time the Lord asks you to do something, set your wallet out and say, Mr. Wallet, can I please do that? I mean, it's that kind of, has that weird weight in our lives. <laughs> money is important. Duke Energy will not send me power for free. So we, we, money is, has importance, but under the cross, there's a blessing there. There's an adding to, there's, there's provision for. When suddenly the money is as important as the cross, we got a big wobble. Nutrition and exercise. You can't tell it. I used to be really into that. The, but I, I had to wear even a supplement that I was taking would have a weight that was really important to me, like an abnormal weight. Now, I'm not saying I couldn't ask for peace of the Holy Spirit, wisdom. I'm not saying I did this perfectly, but I'm saying even exercise for me for a season got out of whack so to where it was the filter I was thinking about everything through. Well, how's this going to affect my exercise? Oh, I can't go to that Bible study. I've got exercise. I mean, it just, it got into this weird, weighty thing. And, and again, I'm not saying that looks different for you than me. Thankfully, the Holy Spirit, he has a plethora of ideas and how he does things. So I can't even judge you on what you're doing unless you come and we talk and we both work it out together. But I'm just saying I've seen people go really askew with this, giving it like somehow, I guess it's saying, I always joke, my Tanya and I, Moses is like, does this manna make me look fat? I'm hoping I get to 120 years if I keep eating this. <laughs> I don't know, that's my, my own bad humor. All right, self-help systems, Jesus and this system, this methodology, this thing that I'm going to give weight to, um, Safety and security for us and our kids. Some people I've seen just go crazy about protecting their kids in a bubble, and it's like they are the, they are the Messiah of their children that they have to control and oversee everything, and it can get really weighty and weird. Public image on social platforms. That one I don't have to worry about myself, but the has a lot of weight for some people. Political party or candidate. I mean, how many times have I heard that this is the most important election, or this is the most important election. And, and, and that may very well be true. But what it does is it puts fear in my heart that if that outcome doesn't happen like I need it to, then all is lost. Like Jesus is going, oh, I didn't see that coming. What are we going to do? <laughs> I mean, we should vote. We should pray. We should vote as the Lord leads us, be a good steward of us citizens of the country, and do these things, do our part, even participate, go so far as to not be complainers, but even participate in the systems in some ways if you're called. But what we can't do is give our faith into this, that we're going to elect the right combination of people, and suddenly this is going to happen. Our faith is in Christ. So that's the weight. What does a subtle wobble, that was hard to say, subtle wobble look like? So this is what, just again, this is what's going on in my heart. There's more things. Indecision, lack of peace, or restlessness. That's what it looks like to me. One of our greatest testimonies as believers, and again, this is the pot calling the kettle black. I'm working on this. But one of our greatest testimonies is that we are in rest, we're in peace, and we're in joy. That screams Jesus to me. Because Jesus, walking around, was in peace, rest, and a measure of joy. And he is the perfect example. So when I'm starting to, uh, 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 and it's just, it's haunting. It'll wake you up at night, it'll, your boat's being tossed to and fro, I mean, you're getting beat up. There's a chance that you've added something that you haven't given it to the cross, that you haven't put it under the feet of Christ. And it has this abnormal weight. Like, I'll get, I'll get, sometimes there was some money issues passed in my life, and I would wake up worried about that because it had such a grip on my heart. It was, I, there's no way it was under Christ. It was, how am I going to solve this? <laughs> how am I going to fix this? 
And so I gave up my peace and my rest because I wanted to take ownership of it. And Jesus is like, have all you want, Brian. You'll be back. Because yeah. <laughs> he lets me run hard and fast into a brick wall sometimes because that's the only way I've decided to learn it, certain things. The issue is more like your identity. You're identified in that weird, that, that element, that aspect. Grumpiness and intolerance. Again, Tanya could, Tanya could testify for me. That's, that can be part of my, the grumpiness of the household. So it goes with Brian sometimes. Fervor for only one aspect or topic such that it is the filter for most decisions. So suddenly every decision comes, has to come through that part of the filter because you've added it to and given it such a weight. Forming a club mentality, isolation or exclusions. I mean, I can't tell you how many times at New Life I've seen people take one thing of the message and go hard after it, and sure enough, in six months, they're gone because it became the thing. It's hard to explain, but I've just seen it. I've been here, I say I just see it over and over. You can almost, I've literally spotted it when like somebody will get a hold of something and you see it has this really weird thing and they won't hear anything, but it's just, it's all about this, about this, about this, and it's this one thing, and then they're gone because it leads to that, that wobble effect. But being special because of inside informa- insider information, pride or elitism, I know how to speak in tongues, and you don't. You know, I mean, we would never say that, but it, it filters through our brain. It, it really made me sad. I realized a couple things in my life, if I was honest, I'm like that tax collector in that parable. Oh, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like that one over there that can't do this. That's a, I always want to be that person. I don't want to be the tax collector. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm going to be the tax collector, not the Pharisee that's puffy, but the, that's what I see sometimes when things are given abnormal weight or they're out of whack. It suddenly, it makes you feel like you got a little insight. I know how to get to Jesus. You don't call me. Thinking less of others for their ignorance, assuming your ideas is what most people need. That's interesting when like, when I was in that St. Teresa of Avila phase, meditation was the answer for everything. I didn't even need the Holy Spirit because I knew the answer. <laughs> oh, your life's going to heck in a handbasket? Meditate. <laughs> I didn't even ask the Lord. I just, you know, knew it worked. Scripture's reminding us that Christ is in all and is all for the believer's life, and more scriptures, I should say. And when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Christ Jesus and him crucified. Now, I've always been, when I was a young guy, we went to church. I might have been with Tanya. We went to some Baptist churches when we were, she, she grew up that way, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But I remember we sang this hymn one time that had the word, Here I Raise My Ebenezer, was in the hymn. I was like, what the heck's an Ebenezer? You know, and so I remember asking all these Baptists around me, they're like, I don't know. <laughs> We're just singing it. <laughs> I was like, that, and that was like pre-Google. I had to like go figure out how to look it up. And by the way, Ebenezer means rock of help, help rock. Uh, so, but, so it bugs me to read something that I don't really understand, that I just give a passive nod to. So I was thinking on, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, Paul taught on marriage. He taught on tongues. He made tents. Obviously, he did other things than just nothing among you except Jesus Christ. And so the the analogy I'd give is if your mother said to you growing up or now, I have told you a thousand times, pick up after yourself. It's like, a, it's like an exaggeration to get a point across. So in other words, to me, that saying, Paul's saying, and this is, again, just my understanding of praying into it, everything I do comes through Jesus Christ. That's what that says to me. Every making tense, it's about Jesus Christ. Talking about tongues, it's about Jesus Christ. 
counseling about marriage, it's about Jesus Christ and him crucified because that, everything has to flow through that. So that's kind of my way of, of, of reconciling that scripture. Our testimony being one in rest, peace, and joy. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will be added, placed under the cross for you. I mean, keep in mind, the Father loves to give us good stuff. I mean, look at this world, look at this beauty of spring and going on a hike, being outside, enjoying a beautiful day, all these things he loves to do. It's just through Christ, in Christ, that he's designed it to be the best. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but the one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Mary chose the one thing, nothing else. Everything else comes through it. Ways to protect our hearts from faith in Christ alone. I'm doing okay. Do not, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. So not based on my cleverness, thank goodness. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So there's our guard, right? That's the shield. That's the encampment that we can stay in is if we will talk to him, interact with him, give thanks to him, acknowledge him, be aware of him, he promises, I'm going to set up a guardrail around you, Brian, so that you're going to be able to recognize when things are getting a little screwy because I'm going to deal with this again. I may strip all the BBs off the top today, but next week there's going to be a temptation to stick one right back on there because I'm going to want to take control of my, my life. I'm captain of my own ship or whatever. And so I'm going to fight that probably for a long time but he's promised he'll help guard against that. So, ways to protect our hearts from faith in Christ alone, the ways to guard our heart. A lot of prayer with thanksgiving. I mean, a lot of these are Christian basics, but you just got to ask yourself if you're really applying them or not. Consistent and life-giving Bible reading. I've done the dry Bible reading. I like the life-giving Bible reading much better. Yeah. I'd rather read one scripture with the Holy Spirit than read a chapter of boredom. Life-giving community with people moving forward in their faith. I mean, there's groups that will suck the life out of you, and there's groups that will give you life. And so I recommend the giving. <laughs> Do you repent easily? Really, gift of repentance should be an ongoing thing. I really, I, it's almost like the more I repent, probably the closer, better I'm doing, because... I quickly recognize, ooh, that thought was not of you, God. I'm sorry. You know, or whatever. I'm, I'm, I can be quick to repent. And openness that the Spirit works differently in various people, and that is by design. The Lord takes my perfectly good theology and throws it away sometimes, or takes like the etch-a-sketch and shakes, you know, or it's like, but Lord, I had you figured out in that area. Wait, you, you can't do that in Him. We're like, I, I can too. I'm God. You know, I mean, <laughs> it lines up with the scripture. But I think overall, I just have to remember that the Holy Spirit in you and me is two different expressions. And that's okay. He budgeted. He wants that. That's how he reaches all the different kinds of people. And can you hear and easily obey the Spirit's mostly subtle ways? For such a big, big God, he sure does whisper quite a bit, at least to me. So I have to yield my heart and shut up long enough and calm my spirit to be able to hear his spirit because he will not dignify himself to have to shout, I think. I, I like Trevor has taught from the pulpit, when the Lord has to shout, you're probably in bad trouble. All right, in closing. Hey, I did the 1154, man. 15 slides equals whatever down there. All right. Okay, in closing, I just want you to leave with that image. We were made by a designer with a purpose just as the top. 
The world and our flesh longs to add to the work of the of Christ, saying the work of the cross is surely not enough. I need more. All the way back to the garden, all the way forward. Diligence and awareness of the work of Christ is our only protection from this tendency. Is there anything in your life that has divided your heart or faith? Are you wobbling? Just an honest conversation with the Lord. Does something have weight, more weight than it really should? Don't let your heart be divided. Be honest. Really important. Repent and be free to spin. That's it. Amen.